Thank you very much, and, and thank you all for, uh, for coming to the talk today. Phosphorus is essential for all life. It's found in our bodies. Uh, we use phosphorus to convert food to energy, to power our muscles. Phosphorus is involved in the genetic material used for renewal of our cells and for reproduction so we can have children. So it is a very important chemical element uh, for life. By disrupting the phosphorus cycle, we have poisoned our drinking water. The slide on the right shows a lake with too much phosphorus and the floating scum of algae. Most of those are, the, the algae are toxic cyanobacteria, commonly called blue-green algae, that release the same uh, toxins that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, so uh, very undesirable plants and a result of too much phosphorus in our fresh water. By restoring the phosphorus cycle, we make the, the planet safer for ourselves and the life on Earth that supports us. And now you know the main points of my talk. First, I will tell you how we damaged the phosphorus cycle over the last uh, century or two by telling you a story about the region where I live, the Yahara River uh, and its valley around Madison, Wisconsin, United States. That's the blue cross on the diagram. And uh, I, I also, by including this slide, I show you how far I am from home because you can see Japan and the very large blue water there is not a lake. That's, of course, the Pacific Ocean. And uh, we travel a long way to be here, and I'm very happy to be here. I'm enjoying the hospitality of your wonderful country. Thank you uh, for, for having me. After telling you about the Ahara River and Lakes, which represent lakes in Japan and many other countries. Uh, then I will talk about uh, the United States as a whole, so I'll scale up to the United States. And then third, I'll scale up to the whole planet. And then I'll tell you how we solve the problem. Our lakes in Madison, Wisconsin were formed when the glaciers melted around 10 or 12,000 years ago. Uh, this map shows the outline of the lakes uh, as reconstructed at that time. Eventually, as the climate dried, the lakes receded to the red outlines, you see. So the, the red dashed line shows the current uh, outline of, uh, of the lakes. The first people, uh, in, in North America, the first humans came from Asia and uh, crossed into North America and uh, the descendants of the Asians who came settled around, some of them settled around these lakes and we know from archeology span that the lakes were sacred to those first people and very important to them. In 18, about 1840, the European Americans came, and we know from uh, their notes, they kept uh, notes that we can read uh, in English about, uh, about uh, the lakes, and we know that the water was very clear. You could see 10 or 12 meters into the water to, and see the bottom. All of the lakes had white sand beaches all the way around them and were surrounded by towering trees, very large old growth trees around 1830. And now it is very different. The map on the left shows the watershed land use and land cover in 2010. The pink area is urban area, it's the city. And the yellow area is farmland, the green is natural vegetation. So you can see that most of the drainage is either the city of Madison or farmland with scattered remnants of uh, native vegetation. The headwater lake, Lake Mendota, the, the biggest, I'm gonna try this pointer again. 
the, this lake, the, this is the headwater lake, Lake Mendota, and here's a satellite image of Lake Mendota. Uh, and the green is cyanobacteria. Toxic cyanobacteria blooms as seen from space, the result of the phosphorus pollution that has occurred. So how did we get there? This diagram shows a timeline of events, and I, I won't go through all the detail, but a timeline of events from uh, the first settlement around uh, 1830 or 1840 to the present day. One of the big events that made the lakes too rich in phosphorus was plowing the prairie. The uh, native prairie vegetation is very deep rooted. It kept the soil in place. And when we plowed it, that ability to retain soil was lost. And a tremendous amount of rich prairie soil eroded into the lakes. And now, if we take a core of Lake Mendota, we find a 75 centimeter thick, 75 centimeters of black prairie soil that dates to 1870. So we lost a lot of topsoil in that single event of the initial plowing of the prairie. By the 1880s, uh, we saw the effects of that erosion. Uh, oxygen disappeared from the deep water of the lake. Um, oh, also, I should add, by the 1880s, there was an actual scientist working on the lake. So limnology, the science of limnology, began in Madison. And a man named Edward Burge was there taking data. So, so we know we had lost our oxygen uh, by, uh, by the 1880s. Um, the, uh, we had very high sulfate levels because the rich prairie soil had gypsum in it. And Gypsum is calcium sulfate, and uh, sulfur complexes with iron and forms pyrite, which is insoluble. And the insoluble pyrite stripped all the iron from the water. And by now you're asking, why should I care? The reason that's important is iron is a natural regulator of phosphorus. And when the iron is stripped out, the phosphorus is freely soluble and widely available to all of the plants, including toxic cyanobacteria. So even by the 1880s, uh, these, these, uh, they didn't have satellites, but they had, uh, had toxic cyanobacteria blooms. Then, and, and that continued, and then in the 1950s, it got worse. In the 1950s, we had uh, industrial capacity to fix nitrogen from the air. And so we could make nitrogen fertilizer out of nitrogen gas, which is 80% of the atmosphere. And um, uh, geologists found natural deposits of phosphate rock, which were mined. So the fertilizer contained the nitrogen fixed from the air, phosphate rock mined from deposits underground, and also potassium. And Anyone who's ever bought fertilizer for their lawn knows that, that uh, those three elements are, are the components of, of uh, fertilizer. The, uh, the, the boom in crop production caused by the industrial fertilizers allowed expansion of dairy because there was extra grain so you could grow cows and build a dairy industry and also have meat from cows, pigs, chickens for people to eat. So that all developed. When we had all the, when all, all those animals came, they had manure. And manure contains a lot of phosphorus. And when it rains, manure goes downhill into the lakes and causes blooms. So the cycle of phosphorus that causes blooms became much more intensive. Uh, when we had industrial fertilizer. Now, just in modern times, we have a wetter climate with more extreme storms. 
the uh, plot here shows year from 1940, the first year of data, up to the present time. And this axis, the vertical axis, is the return time in years of a 100 millimeter rainstorm. 100 millimeters in a single storm is about that much. That's a lot of rain. In, in one day. And uh, the return time is the average time between events. And in the 1940s, it was more than five years, almost six years in between storms as large as 100 millimeters. Now it's about two years. So about every other year, we have a storm of 100 millimeters. Uh, these uh, photographs show this, the uh, big storm in 2008. So we had one of these uh, 100 millimeter storms in 2008. This is a photograph of the university campus. And uh, uh, people, well, it was easy to find a parking space, but uh, these people were very disappointed to find their cars underwater. This is one of the crop fields uh, around Lake Mendota, and all of that water that's running off contains manure and fertilizer and is carrying it right into the lake to make more algae. So the increase in big precipitation events is making the enrichment of the lakes and the algae blooms worse. Um, and this slide simply shows some of the big floods we've had. In August uh, 2018, uh, we had a flood this is Madison's famous isthmus between uh, Lake Mendota and Lake Monona, and the isthmus flooded. And that's millions of dollars worth of real estate, office buildings, high-rise apartment buildings, and people's houses. That's a big, expensive mess. And about the same time, Kansai Airport flooded. And I knew about Kansai Airport because I had visited Kyoto University a couple of years before and flown into Kansai Airport. And I was very sad to uh, see the photograph in the New York Times of this, of this flood. So I know Japan also see, has seen big floods just as, as we have. So let me summarize the transitions that we've seen. Each one of these transitions is a big lurch, a lurch downward in the water quality of the lake, a regime shift, uh, if, if you wish. First, we saw the erosion of topsoil into the lake. And because the topsoil had lots of gypsum and removed iron from solution, it rapidly increased phosphorus cycling from sediment. So we began to get a phosphorus uh, rapid mineralization from sediment. Then we had industrial agriculture uh, with fertilizers and more meat. Dairy and meat industries expanding because of abundant grain to feed cows, pigs, and chickens. And now we have more extreme precipitation, more erosion of fertilizer and manure, more blooms, more toxicity, more cost to clean water. This pattern has occurred throughout North America, parts of South America, all of Western Europe, and I suspect that it has occurred in Japan for some Japanese lakes, and it has happened in China as China developed. So we have more and more of this going on around the world. Um, in, when the lake is in its rich state, uh, the cyanobacteria fluctuate. So this slide shows the amount of cyanobacteria actually measured every minute by a buoy in the center of the lake versus day of the year in 2017. And you can see these rapid fluctuations from high to low levels. This is a logarithmic scale. So that's 10 orders of magnitude fluctuation. So when the cyanobacteria are low, the water is relatively clear. When they're high, it's a big mess, like you see here in this photograph. Um, 
Someone asked about uh, uh, alternate states and, and resilience, and uh, if you fit a Langevin equation to uh, this data, you get an unstable threshold at the red line, and there is a s stable point, a clear water stable point down here, and a dirty water stable point up here. But it's also, it's obvious that uh, beyond those, uh, those stable points, there is enormous variation variability. So the story is really not the stability. The story is the variability of the cyanobacteria in, uh, in, in the lake. About 2010, I led a project of involving several faculty at University of Wisconsin, a climatologist, a hydrologist, myself, a landscape ecologist, and uh, two social scientists. And uh, we uh, tr uh, worked on a project to develop stories about the future. Um, and we began by interviewing dozens of people, and then we ran workshops, workshops for about 15 people or so uh, each. And at the workshops, the people were asked to develop stories about the future. So we asked them, uh, what, what, is, what do you hope for the future in 2070? What are your fears? What do you fear might happen by 2070? What do you think makes us resilient to threats? What, why is our region strong and resilient when things go, go badly? And what makes our region vulnerable? How, what kinds of shocks from the outside could make us uh, fall into a worse condition? And develop stories about that. And everyone did. And we then looked at the stories, and we realized there are really only about four stories here. And I, I don't have time to go through them, but there's a website right there where you can read them yourself if you want. We had a professional writer write up each story in the form of a magazine article so you can read it in about 10 or 15 minutes. The idea was people would read them while they were uh, waiting for their dentist appointment or something like that. And we hired a professional artist to illustrate them, so they're quite beautifully illustrated. We also developed a video for each story for the younger generation who uh, learns from, from videos. I'm from the generation that cannot learn from a video, but, but I appreciate it that younger people can. And, uh, and, and we then developed computer models and developed quantitative output for each uh, scenario. The quantitative output was important to bring the decision makers and the engineers uh, on board. They wanted to see some numbers, and, and we generated those. And our goal was to stimulate conversation in the region and just have a better conversation about where we want to go. And, and I believe that occurred. There, uh, there was a great deal of interest in the stories. Uh, reading groups picked them up, had discussions. Uh, many churches uh, used them uh, to, to discuss uh, uh, the ethical issues of, of where things are going to go. I was invited to give talks at several churches ab about uh, about the uh, scenarios. Um, I was also invited to talk at several bars, so it was quite a cross-section of people uh, interested in, in, in the scenarios. But I, I think it was a success in getting a, a better conversation going. And after a while, the politicians invited us in to talk to them. And then we were in the inside room telling them the stories and talking about the outcomes that, uh, that, that could occur. So to date, here in 2022, um, we have seen an expanded cover of native vegetation. The county board and the county uh, chairman uh, have al allocated more budget money to buy farmland and convert it to native vegetation, which is deep-rooted and holds the soil in place. And as a result, we're seeing reduction in, in f intensity of floods, improvement in water quality, and also the native vegetation stores carbon, which is a climate side benefit.
We have seen organizations emerge to improve water quality. Yahara Pride Farmers is a group of farmers who voluntarily got together and have figured out better ways to compost manure. And when the manure is composted, it's easy to plow it back into the soil and uh, in a form that will not run off and uh, harm water quality. Uh, the county has invested in manure digesters. The idea of a manure digester is you digest the manure and produce a dry fertilizer product that is cheap to transport because it's light and dry. You can easily move it to areas that need fertilizer. And it, the, fer the fermentation process produces methane gas, which is then captured and used to drive automobiles that are methane powered. So you get a, a carbon benefit, a biofuel carbon benefit from that as, as well. So Ed, we, I think we're having, I think it's fair to say we're having a better public conversation about, about the future. And I, I still get questions uh, and requests to talk about the project. Moving to the scale of the entire United States, um, waste of phosphorus occurs throughout our country. So the dark green is soil that has too much phosphorus in it, and the uh, lighter green also has too much, just not quite so much. And just from looking at the map, you can see particularly the eastern half of the United States has a lot of over-enriched soil. Um, with my colleagues and I uh, 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 built a diagram of the fate of phosphorus input. Um, and uh, so uh, this is read from uh, left to right. So I realize that's different from Japanese, how Japanese script would be read, and I apologize for that. But uh, uh, so we go from the inputs of phosphorus, which are fertilizer, uh, to the outputs, where does it go? Where does the phosphorus go? And let me, I, 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 we don't have time to go through the diagram in detail, but let me quickly show you some things that jump out. One is exports exceed imports. So the United States exports more phosphorus than we import. Uh, and that's because we have a capacity to mine phosphorus within our country. So we bring in uh, a relatively small amount of phosphorus in imported meat, uh, and, uh, but we export uh, much, much more meat. Second, only 8% of our phosphorus is consumed by people. And I had always thought that the point of agriculture was to move phosphorus from soil into people. And I'm completely wrong. It's, uh, agriculture is a very inefficient way to move phosphorus into people. It would be better if we just ate the fertilizer directly, which, of, of course, would, would be rather toxic. But uh, 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 farming is not very good at moving phosphorus into people. And finally, more than half is added to the environment more than half of the phosphorus that we add to, grow, to produce food ends up in the environment. Now, the United States is just one country with abundant data, which is why I analyzed it here. But I suspect this pattern holds for all of the countries that have industrial agriculture. So that would be Western Europe, uh, Japan, um, China is beginning to have industrialized agriculture, Uruguay, and Argentina are two South American countries with industrial agriculture. So this seem, I, I, I suggest that this is a, a broader pattern. Thank you. So what's going on at the scale of the whole planet? Does fertilizer waste uh, pollute all of our fresh water? Um, just for historical perspective, this slide shows time measured in people versus a few interesting characteristics of agriculture on the vertical axis. I can, I can measure time in either human population of the planet or years uh, because human population has only gone up. So let's look at time in terms of human population. 
The green here is cereal yield in teragrams per hectare. That's mass of cereal per hectare of land. And it has gone up with population. And that is simply demand driven. So if there are more people, you need more grain, uh, either because people eat the grain directly or they eat cows, pigs, and chickens fed from the grain. So more people, more demand for grain, and we grow more grain. That makes sense. How did we do that? Up until we were about 3 billion, which was 1960, up to about 3 billion, we did it by cutting down forest or plowing prairie and having more arable land. And now we're out of new land. So the curve for arable land has flattened off. We ran out of it. So what did we do then? We started irrigating. And as a result, we are depleting aquifers like the major Indian aquifer, the major aquifer that feeds India, and the major aquifer in the center of the United States, among others. And we started fertilizing. So this is fertilizer use. And um, so uh, we're going to run into limits. And uh, we began you know, we began to have harm to water quality uh, around 1950, as I mentioned earlier. Mining has greatly increased the global flux of phosphorus. Uh, he, this, this slide shows the human input of each element divided by natural inputs. So carbon is a famous one, and we all know that we're using too much carbon. Uh, the, um, the human input of carbon uh, to the biosphere is now about 35 times the natural input to carbon each year. So we're mobilizing a lot of carbon. There's a lot of phosphorus being mobilized too, about 14 times the natural input each year. So mining is a very, very big factor in, in phosphorus pollution. That's where most of it comes from. And phosphorus is over-applied over in many regions. I already uh, uh, mentioned uh, the situation in the United States. Here's Western Europe, India, uh, especially uh, just below the Himalayas where there's a lot of water. Uh, at least until the glaciers are gone, there's a lot of water uh, to grow crops there. Uh, China is booming, and even, even Japan has some green spots here. So these are all areas using too much phosphorus. So, so it's a general pattern. And phosphorus demand is projected to rise. These are uh, model estimates that we did for the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Detlef Van Vuren and colleagues at RIVM extrapolated them to 2100, and the demand only goes up. Fo so where can we mine phosphorus? It turns out that most of the world's phosphorus is in Morocco and Western Sahara, two relatively small countries on uh, the western edge of the Sahara Desert, and they've got most of it. There are a few other countries, China, the US, uh, Southern Africa, uh, others named there that, that have uh, bits of it, but most of it is in Morocco and Western Sahara. In uh, 2007 and 2008, there was a political breakdown between Morocco and Western Sahara, and they took their phosphorus off the market. They did not mine any, they did not export any. So most of the world's phosphorus left the market in 2007, 2008. China became concerned and they closed their exports as well. A couple of other countries did also. And as a result, less phosphorus on the market, the price goes sky high. Price of phosphorus fertilizer exploded. Poor farmers could not afford it. And particularly in the Middle East and North Africa, there was famine. Uh, and the, this, the famine is associated with the, uh, the Arab Spring, 
of those of those years in in the rebellions in Egypt, Tunisia, and other countries that uh, that that led to change in governance. So this is an example of phosphorus being directly implicated in the causal chain that led to instability in in the planet. And uh, we may the events in uh, Ukraine may yet lead to another example because Ukraine is the major food exporter to Middle East, North Africa, and that food may not be there. So phosphorus is essential for food production and for human life, uh, but it's also a serious water pollutant that harms health, and it's a cause of global instability. Given that, should we think about putting some limits on the phosphorus that we dump into water, which is essentially wasted phosphorus? And if so, what should those limits be? This was one of the questions of the Planetary Boundary uh, Project. Um, in the case of phosphorus, the planetary boundary is the maximum phosphorus for healthy water. How much could you have and still be able to drink the water or bathe with it or fish in it? And it, the World Health Organization has a number for that, and that number is consistent with the science that I and others have done on, on lakes. So the idea is to come up with a goal. We, we have to meet the goal hit the maximum amount in rivers and lakes, uh, given all of these other interactions, mining, weathering, all the dynamics of soil and lakes uh, that, uh, that are involved in the cycle. I'm not going to go through the math of the calculation, but I'll show you the result. Uh, we came up with low estimates. The, the planetary boundary is no lower than the green bar, uh, and it is no, probably no higher than the yellow bar. The range there is due to the uncertainty of global data for phosphorus uh, uh, dynamics. So, uh, you know, we simply honestly reported that uncertainty. The red bar is the current level of phosphorus use. So, phosphorus flux to fresh water is at the red level, and this is the maximum planetary boundary, this is the minimum. Phosphorus input to soil is at this level. This is the largest possible estimate of boundary. Amount of phosphorus in soil is the red level. The yellow is the highest possible estimate, al allowing all the uncertainty to move to the high end. So we're using way too much phosphorus globally if we want to have healthy water on the planet. So the fifth transition is how do we change to create a better future? And uh, let's go back to the planetary boundary diagram to see the answer. It's not that hard. We want to have less, we want to have less mining of phosphorus. Just leave it in, the, leave it in the ground. We want to have more recycling to soils. So instead of mining phosphorus, let's build healthy soil by recycling waste phosphorus from human waste, livestock manure, and decomposing crops um, and build it up in the soil and have a healthy phosphorus rich soil instead of going uh, to mine it and then there will be less flow into rivers and lakes. Let me quickly summarize my main points. Phosphorus is a rare element that's essential for life. Your, your body is several percent phosphorus, and, and, and it's in bones, it's in your genetic material, and it's in your energy transfer system for converting food uh, to, uh, to muscle action. We've extracted phosphorus at 14 times the natural rate worldwide. Excess phosphorus causes toxic blooms in water that impair human health and make the water unusable for drinking, swimming, fishing, things we like to use water for. Phosphorus needs can be met by recycling waste to soil at a supply rate that meets demand for plant growth. 
We know how to do that. It's just a matter of doing it. Recycling phosphorus uh, improves water quality and human health and stabilizes the food supply, prevents the sort of political instability that we saw in 2007 and 2008. So I hope that we learn those lessons and that uh, the result is that the world moves to very healthy landscapes like this one from the Driftless area of Southwest Wisconsin, which is in balance for, uh, for phosphorus. And you'll see it has lots of natural forest, lots of natural prairie, strip cropping to keep the soil in place, and, uh, uh, and practices, uh, it, it's uh, dairy farming, but it's done by rotational grazing, which keeps the phosphorus on the land. Thank you very much.